regional office. We help to implement, monitor, and evaluate the report on the Agenda 2030 and the African Union 2063 in West Africa, assisted with the formulation of ECOWAS Vision 2050 framework document, supported the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, CFTA, in the West Africa region and also coordinated impact assessment of COVID-19 and recovery response, among others. Our tax at the African Union Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Africa CDC, included focusing on the facilitation of partnerships between the Africa CDC and finance and economic planning communities developing strategy and identifying the best practices to engage relevant stakeholders, to leverage financing for health, supporting the health economics and financing program of the Africa CDC, to develop context relevant to health financing mechanism to boost investment in public health. As we seek to build a vibrant economy that is inclusive and where jobs are sustainable, the time for all Liberians to put our nation first is now. We must confront and meet the foe with valor and pretending. The main reason for our economic backwardness is the old economic model, which relies mainly on exploitation of raw materials, especially iron ore, rubber, and other minerals, with limited emphasis on economic diversification which usually paves the way for industrialization of an economy. We must be intentional about innovation and thinking outside the box. And outside the box thinking, for example, should consider the Liberia's program with the IMF should be one that should go side by side with a robust, coordinated, and integrated framework that maps out where resources are to be spent for optimal results. The new economic model that should resonate with all Liberians, especially policymakers, can be coined in the slogan, Made in Liberia, a commitment. By giving the private sector center stage in policy decision making as the engine for growth and development. The time has come to move away from government being the largest employer to the private sector as the anchor for sustainable job creation. Government's policy should intentionally support domestic value addition with Liberian entrepreneurs leading the charge. In this regard, the government should work with our development partners to ensure that development assistance be aligned with our national development plan. A big thank you to our development partners for the continued support to the government and our people. Tangible investment largely in agriculture value chain, where smallholders are supported smartly, will be a good start. This is the soft side from my perspective. The heavy lifting of Liberia's structural transformation can only be guaranteed when most of the borrowing go towards addressing the binding constraints, which includes high cost of electricity and limited paved roads, especially along the growth corridors, and strengthening the financial system for more support to development projects. The absence of a capital market in Liberia is another problem raising needed capital for development, something which requires more attention by the government. We must know what we want, agree on what we want, and just do it. Distinguished Senators, the over 16 years of distinguished public sector experience dealing with monetary and fiscal matters and of Liberia as Deputy Governor for Economic Policy and Minister of Finance and Development Planning, among others, coupled with my recent experience outside of Liberia as a consultant with the UNECA, in the African Union, dealing with macroeconomic and public health financing issues clearly make me in best fate to serve again 
as Minister of Finance to steward our nation's finances. When confirmed as Minister, we will work hard with your collaboration and support to reposition our economy on a sustainable path of growth and form by depending new national development plan that places more emphasis on agriculture, roads, and education. This will mean working to secure and sustain financing for critical investments and assuring the optimization of public resources where efficiency gains are clearly in the interest of all our people. Distinguished Senators, it is important to note that we will be taking over the nation's finances at an extraordinarily challenging time. The effects of COVID-19 and the Ukraine-Russia war on the global economy still linger with implications for global growth and demand for commodity exports from Liberia. There have been issues of low economic growth in the last six years with an average of 1.3%, double-digit inflationary pressure on the back of exchange rate depreciation, and frequent recast of the national budget on account of underperforming revenue. The fiscal balance of the government that we are inheriting is, a, is in a very bad state. The report of 40 million as the GOL's consolidated account balance as of January 19, 2024 is not supported by the facts. The balance is reported by the CBO as of the same date was 20.5 million. Liberian dollars balance is converted and added to the US dollar balance. Highly encumbered, not 40 million. When it comes to the dual consolidated account balances, there can be no commingling of balances of the old fiscal year, i.e. FY 2023, and the new fiscal year 2024. Consistent with section 34 of the amended PFM Act of 2009. This means all encumbrances and commitment on claims on the existing order account, which in this case is the FY 2023 consolidated account balance. Records show that the MFDB borrowed 18 million from the CBL to fund payroll for November and December of 2023. We will give greater clarity on this matter as we proceed. New borrowings that further widen the budget deficit, section 16 of the amended restatement of the PFM Act of 2009 on competition of budget surplus or deficit. As we have been made aware that Liberia has been sanctioned due to lack of payment of dues to the African Union and the African Development Bank. In addition, a default in payment of about 650000 to the European Investment Bank is preventing the disbursement of over $13 million for the Sanikuli Lokatul Road. Now, other institutions have reached out to us because of government non-payment of interest principal commission to several international organizations, including Export Import Bank of China, OPEC Fund for International Development, and the International Fund for Agriculture. These are just a few examples of the issues we are inheriting. A full fiscal review to determine the 2023 fiscal outturn will be done swiftly, and outcomes be made known to this honorable body and the public when confirmed. Nonetheless, amidst these challenges, we will work with the Liberian Revenue Authority to strengthen revenue collection and help improve tax administration. Domestic resource mobilization must take center stage through innovation and at the same time closing loopholes and minimizing other influences affecting revenue collection. Key emphasis must be on digital technology in revenue collection. On the expenditure front, in these challenging economic times, the government will have to take appropriate austerity measures 
by shifting resources toward priority sectors such as rural, agriculture, health, education, and security. Distinguished Senators, public sector investment project, RE capital expenditure, should increase to at least 15% as a share of the 2024 national budget. In year one, under which the Biden administration has come. This is one of the areas we can work together to improve the well-being of the Liberian people. In conclusion, we once again thank His Excellency President Joseph Newman Boyka for our preferment and assure the Honorable Senate Ways, Men's Finance and Budget Committee that we will work with the National Legislature and our development partners in strengthening our public financial management system creating an enabling environment to do business in Liberia and placing the nation's finances on a sustainable path to deliver the investment needed for economic growth and job creation. We now submit our presentation for your record and take any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take the uh, second and final presentation from the Commissioner General of the Liberia Revenue Authority. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co Chair, and members of the Budget and Finance Committee. Please permit me to stand on the protocols already established by the finance minister designate. Like the finance minister, I want to extend profound thanks and appreciation to the president of Liberia for my preferment and want to assure him and this august body as well as all of our people of my utmost in ensuring that legitimate revenues are collected and that we have efficiency in those revenue collections to ensure that our people get the best value for our public resources. Thank you also, Senators, for this opportunity for me to present my strategic vision in leading the Revenue Authority, which essentially is going to focus on three major prompts institutional strengthening, revenue expansion, and governance improvement. On the institutional strengthening piece, you will agree with me that the foundation of an effective revenue authority lies in robust institutional structure. I will be proposing a revision to the framework that we currently have so that we can have transformation in elevating the authority to grant it a full autonomy status. This, in my belief, will be able to solve a lot of the operational antecedent problems that exist with the current SEMA autonomous structure that the authority currently has. You will also all recall that when it decision was made a couple of years ago to detach the Department of Budget from the Ministry of Finance, I'm sorry, the Department of Revenue from the Ministry of Finance and create the Liberia Revenue Authority. The thinking at the time was that this will be a five-year experiment and the hope was that once we got it right to eventually graduate the authority to a full autonomy status. Even though there has been marked improvement, and this is not to say there has not been challenges, but the uh, granting the authority, the full autonomy, is still an action that is overdue and outstanding. This full autonomy will empower the authority to make strategic decisions swiftly, allocate resources more effectively, and be accountable for delivering results. We will also work 
at building, restoring the merit-based system, which is paramount to ensure that promotions, appointments, etc., are based on competence and performance, thereby fostering a culture of excellence and integrity. On the revenue expansion prong, we know that revenue generation is the basis for our nation's fiscal health. And as you heard the president in his annual message to the nation, and also as you just heard from the finance minister, most of these services that each of them have committed to supporting for our people rely heavily, if not entirely, on our revenue generating capacity. In so doing, there are certain key aspects that we want to focus on in our revenue generation framework. The first one is we need to look at our exemption regime you know, and see whether there are efficiencies that we could deploy. And for that, we will work with the Ministry of Finance, yourselves and the uh, presidency, as well as the National Investment Commission, the Ministry of Commerce and other actors to ensure that we can be able to optimize you know, and see the relevance of some of those incentives and how we could be able to rationalize them so that we can be able to increase revenue inputs, I mean revenue intake. We also will work with you as well as with other stakeholders in help in decentralizing revenue collection. We know that the last legislature passed the Local Government Act, and as a part of that act, you know, we need to decentralize some of these revenue functions. Such things as real estate property tax collection, as well as other tax and service and, and fees would need to be devolved to the municipalities for greater efficiency as well as for revenue sharing. Another area that we intend to focus on is revising our consumer tax system. Currently, as you all know, the current legislature, there is a bill before the legislature for the value added tax law. The pilot that LRA has conducted with that shows that there's multiple increased potential in domestic revenue mobilization. You know, if we were able to get this one piece and get the full cooperation of all stakeholders in the process. So we will be working with you in the Ministry of Finance as well as through the President's office to make sure that this bill can be passed into law. You know, then it will give us the empowerment to be able to generate more revenue. And I agree with the Minister that we need to deploy innovative solutions and we need to implement technologies to enhance efficiency and effectiveness of our operation. Now I'd like to lay small emphasis on the efficiency and the effectiveness part because there are you know, uh, reports that in our revenue generation mechanisms, there may be some need for improvement. There may be revenue losses, waste and abuse that we think that by in deploying technology, we can help to minimize some of those you know, uh, uh, waste and abuse. In terms of governance, for a revenue authority to succeed, it must operate within a transparent and accountable governance system. My commitment is to foster strong relationships with various stakeholders, including the Ministry of Finance, the legislature, the judiciary, the business com community, civil society, and other actors, through an open dialogue and collaboration. I believe we can ensure that our policies and practices are not only effective, but also fair and transparent for the benefit of all of our systems. I come to you with nearly three decades of senior managerial experience in both the public and private sector. My records are very clear. Um, it includes work in the private sector. We oversaw the governance of Echo Bank Liberia. 
at a time when it was at a stage of almost collapsing. We managed to turn it around. And for the many decades that EcoBank has been in Liberia, it had never generated any return for its shareholders. But under our leadership, we were able to turn EcoBank around from loss making to profit making. We also spent four years at the Public Procurement and Concessions Commission. And in that role, I had the privilege of working with many of you who are still in this legislature, because many of you were in this legislature at the time. And we all worked to strengthen public procurement. We developed systems, deployed technologies that give greater transparency and accountability. You know, we also have worked in other areas, in academia. Currently, we had the Carter Center where we are implementing you know, development-related projects related to peace and security as well as enhancing our democracy. In conclusion, my vision for the Revenue Authority is one where institutional strength, revenue expansion, and robust governance come together to create an organization that is not only efficient and effective, but also trusted and respected by the people it serves. With your support, I am confident that we can achieve these goals and contribute significantly to our nation's prosperity. Before I end, I would like to uh, make special recognition of my wife, Sada. Sada, raise your hand. Yeah, I want to um, extend my special gratitude to her because she has been my partner from junior high school. Wow. Yes, we were in junior high together and we used to be sneaking from our parents. We were the same age. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So she has been my pillar of strength and my support. And she has made a lifetime commitment to me and will continue to be so. I want to thank her. I want to thank our children. Unlike the minister that has only five, you see? Yeah, we have about two dozen. <laughs> <laughs> and we are very thankful. So I'd like to submit, Mr. Chairman and Honorable Senators, I'm sending back for more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. For the two presentations of ARA, like our colleagues said, the Commissioner Gabba, destiny. This committee will give five minutes each. Two of them, five minutes for interactive. Yeah, five minutes. That was what we said yesterday. No, so it's 10. So it's 10. We agree, yeah. colleagues? Yeah. We agree with that? Yeah. Maximum. Maximum, okay. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we'll take 10 minutes interaction for each senator. When you finish, you finish. Yeah? I said when you finish, you finish. Yeah, to the both of uh, you. We have them asked to give. The first preference to our protem in Meritus, I think he has some other obligation. So we'll begin with uh, Senator Chi to give his uh, questions or concerns in 10 minutes. Thank you. Let me work on my. My former colleague from the university. Back to government and the junior brother back to government as well. I believe you guys have the relevant experience to bring to, to the table. So the minister was speaking, and as soon as I heard go down on iron holes and my eyes started opening, but that's my area. So he said that uh, the whole mother dependence on the traditional export of coal, glamours, iron ore, and rubber. That's the whole model. 
the new model to be diversification. For me, I heard this over and over and over. The government goes, the government comes, see an economic model. I believe besides diversification, what we need to do is to put in money in the sectors, revenue generating sectors, and improve on them greatly. Because anytime you read the bulletin from Central Bank, when there's a growth, you will read that primarily due to exports of gold, growth in that sector. So there are sectors we need to, to, to spend money on to make them more profitable. Let me go now to my inquiry. Several years back, there are two distinct ministries, Ministry of Planning and Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Finance. We merged them. Since we merged them, we were from the public sector and from the public, general public, have been complaining. They say the Ministry of Planning and the activities have all vanished. Do you agree with the minister? Yeah, interactive. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator Chair. And um, it's good that you brought this up, and we've been yeah, in conversation yeah. around this issue. Certainly, I, I align myself with that sentiment yeah, that the structure, even the current structure of the Ministry of Finance and Development Planning, and the manner and form in which it positions the development planning section of the ministry. Uh, obviously has to change. And, and in conversation with professional colleagues, my professional uh, uh, and personal take on this matter would be to revert. There is a need to give full recognition to the development planning piece of our nation. It cannot be subsumed in the way it is currently. And, and in that regard, I, 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 I certainly believe the, the attempt to move our country in the direction that is solidified, sustained, it must be informed by the planning piece, and that cannot be uh, a place of second guessing. And the relevant training, because everything that has to do with total factor productivity, informing the development planning piece, the extent to which the right labor force contribution, all of those will have to be properly planned, and that means uh, just having a minister, a deputy minister for budget and development planning, uh, that's not a way to proceed. And certainly we say it has to change. And we will work with you uh, very soon. And by God's grace, when confirmed, we think those will be one of the areas for legislative reform. Thank you. So my next question goes to both of you. Talk about uh, the uh, revenue generation and the uh, exemption regime. I want to discuss the incentive agreement scheme. There are two types of incentive agreements depending on the threshold. Some are issued by the Ministry of Finance Development Planning without legislative approbation, and some with legislative approbation. On the threshold. And uh, the public is also concerned. The original talk was good, but uh, tax experts feel that uh, we are losing. We are losing from the previous incentive agreements that have been executed, that have been signed for the government. For many reasons, the only reason is that of uh, uh, proper monitoring. Do you still want to proceed with the grant of incentives, or you want to get rid of that? I think this is this is as part of the the transition uh, engagement, and as as a serve in the capacity as the cluster lead for the economic and financial governance cluster. Uh, we went into a more detailed deep dive when it came to the existing tax incentive regime. 
and from all of the conversation and the advice from the technical experts, we need to institute, like now, a review of the entire tax incentive regime and treat them on a case-by-case -case basis and look at the economic benefits to the nation, its people, in terms of what returns have we gained from these incentives. So on a case-by-case -case basis, it's important that we do that as soon as possible uh, and let that process review, reflect the extent to which revenue generation that will come out of the tax expenditure, which we see as a loss, uh, uh, can be reversed and you show that over the last six years, 12 years, averaging 600 million in domestic resource revenue as a government through our budget, we believe that these are some of the areas we have to look at again so that at the end of the day, this will be part of the area we are talking about minimizing those things that are creating some form of loss in the system. And the growth in revenue, if we just do it wrong, automating, making sure that the middle layer uh, of which these incentives are, are, are awarded. So from both the Ministry of Finance, LRA, we will sit together and review these things so that in two years from now, with the right changes in the incentive regime, our revenue collection capacity could be more than one billion. Just doing it right. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator, please permit me to go back, you know, and just to provide some historical context on how Liberia has become trapped in this whole incentive schemes where we negotiate, you know, with each investor and then we give up so much. Um, when the Ministry of Planning and Economic Affairs, which was the subject of your first question, existed, and the last minister turned out to be Senator Conning. I worked with Senator, uh, Minister Conning at the time as his deputy minister for sectoral and development planning. And so we were in on most of the conversations you know, with all the investments that were coming in at that time. At the time, Liberia, we had just come from the Civil War. This was in President Salif's first term. The political economy at the time was for us to be able to make Liberia, one of the key considerations was for us to make Liberia to be attractive to foreign direct investments. We, and I think together we did a pretty good job. That's because the news about Liberia at the time were things to the effects of being cannibals, you know, being brutal, a brutal civil war. I mean, I don't want to remind people. But those, that was the situation at the time. And this is what led us to begin because one of the fears, every time we have private meeting, you know, it's been many years now, I think I can say this in public, the concerns on the government side was that if you hold these people too hard, maybe they will go to Sierra Leone, maybe they will go to Gambia, maybe they will go to other places. And we need to prove that Liberia is stable, Liberia is safe. Are those considerations still the same right today? I don't think so. I think we've made tremendous improvement. And I agree with the minister. This is about the time for us to review and see whether that's the regime that we want to go. My view on that is that we strengthen our tax regime, our revenue code, and make it so that you know, there is a general rule that applies to everyone and anyone. So that investors don't have to come here and be scrambling to meet with people here and there and be trying to find lobbyists and people who can introduce them. No, we have the general rule. And then like the minister said, in extraneous cases under that regime, then we can look at case by case. But in the meantime, I think part of the review that we need to conduct is to look at the performance of all those we've given these incentives to. Because many times when you read these agreements, you see lofty things that they are supposed to do. You know? But when you go into you know, the areas of operation and the things they are supposed to do, you know, then you don't see anything. 
you know, there's one particular case in point. Right now, one, you know, a, 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 a mining concessionaire currently has inundated their communities with jingles and announcements, everything on radio. They're about to build housing for people. They'll build housing for communities. But this is something you should have done since 15 years ago. Okay. Yeah, I'm direct and personal. Yeah. So, so, so as a people, as a people, as part of that review process, we really need to analyze these performances. You know, and, and yes, we do need a jobs that it will create. But believe you me, these are business people. They will not run away. What we need to do is when we set up these systems, let's allow the system to work. If we don't allow the system to work, then we undermine it ourselves. And this is where we got to have that discipline across all of government. We also have to ensure that we strengthen our judiciary, you know, because as chairman of Ecobank, I mean, I came full center with the challenges that we have in the judiciary and how disappointing it is for me to convince my shareholders to pump more money into Liberia. I had to make several trips to Togo, to Lomé, we were meeting all over the place, you know, because why? I mean, broad day cases, unagreeable cases, we lost it in the court, you know? So we need to be able to strengthen our judiciary, work with the judiciary to make sure that investors can have assurances that once they invest their money, you know, they will be able to be protected under, under the law. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Financing and no agreement. Minister, in your statement, you said the government assistance should be aligned with our real national needs. The public also know that. In fact, they have been telling us that so the loans we take, whether they are beneficial to the country. People sometimes complain that so the panel bring the money and the character or other budgets for one or what's your thoughts on that? Thank you, Senator Chair. So on this, the time has come in terms of just framing and something that for all of us to just reflect. That in the space of six years, what can we show forth for an increase in the public debt stock from 878 million to 2.2 million? An increase of over 1.3 billion. What can we show? So that period has come. Uh, we should ask ourselves, can we see 1.3 billion in agriculture where we invested in critical agriculture infrastructure, equipment, training capacity that we generate because studies have shown if we just do agriculture right, bring in factory DA that add value addition, for example, say the rice we eat, how do we do it differently? Cassava we eat, how do we do it differently? not just only for domestic consumption, but for export. So these are the critical areas in roads. We have 13,000 kilometers of road as the projected target in our country for the last 18 years. We have only been able to do 8.7% of that. So where has 1.3 billion been going? So these are just some critical questions. At this point in time, when we say realign our loan quest to the National Development Plan. So if we are agreeing going forward that a rescue mission that emphasizes an arrest that focuses on agriculture, rules, education, that means my request to say in this first year, let the national budget at least be seen nothing less than 15% towards public sector investment project. If we do it, these are the enablers, rules, agriculture, ICT will be the enablers that will take us to the quest for becoming a middle-income country of a double-digit growth. So certainly, as we work on what comes next regarding the, the new National Development Plan, we are saying the budget going forward should be aligned to the National Development Plan informing the way the budget is structured. 
and then loans are expected to be taken. Thank you. We will now take Senator Mangere. Thank you very much. Let me commend the two nominees. Uh, it's a privilege that I know the, I know the both of them, but I will ask some questions. Uh, my question on answer Jeff was, I don't know that I know Professor Jala, Dr. Uh, Jala very well, I know, but my camera he was my class president. Obama, are you the Obama Kamara who was the deputy governor of Central Bank for, for, for economic affairs? Are you the same Obama Kamara? Yes, this is the same Obama Kamara. Are you the Obama Kamara, the Minister of Finance, Mr. Lee? Yeah. This is the same Obama Kamara. Okay, very well. Thank you very much. Are you the, the, are you the current lead, lead of, for the economic management team of President Joseph Walker? Jen, the Jen Costa on economic and financial government. Okay, so thank you. Are you the same again? <laughs> 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 one minute gone. You know, uh, before I come to you, I don't want to, uh, before I come to the minister, prof, prof you just made mention of the judiciary. Are you saying the issue of the judiciary is an issue of incompetence or is an issue of corruption? Uh, thank you for that question, Senator. The judiciary itself, the Chief Justice, in her series of opening statements at every court opening, has highlighted issues in the judiciary. And those issues include, you know, the ones that you are going to do. My personal opinion is that there's a lot of improvement that needs to be made within the judiciary, you know, just as the uh, improvements that need to be made well, within the, the executive. Problem. The, problem? the problems could be multiple folds. You know, it could be capacity constraint, it could be resource constraint. You know, we operate in a resource constrained environment, you know. So what we need to do as a people, the point I was making is that we need to take a holistic approach, you know, if we're going to review and make sure that we can get the dividends of the reforms that we are engendering. We have to ensure that all the different aspects of government works in a way, in the case of the judiciary, in a way that can restore the confidence you know, or enhance the confidence of the private sector in the judiciary. Can I? Right now, that is a bit wanting. Do you want to say something? Yes, sir. Yeah, in a, in a yeah. So, our recent engagement with the Bankers Association an issue, especially with debt collection in the judiciary, is a concern for the commercial banks. To the extent where a person who has debt for a given banking institution would take the bank to court and the judge rules against the bank. So it comes back again to making sure that people who are seated within the judiciary, within the courts, they should dispense justice. So you think they're making wrong judgment, all right? And by that fact, we and clearly, that's, that's an issue that must be addressed. Well, uh, I can sit here and say, oh yes, they took this for corruption, but the fact that the industry is saying this as an alarming situation, it takes away investment from our country and even for the extension of credit that we are so desiring for our rebirth as a country. Then, uh, my other question to you to, on Mojala. You are going to the LRA. Then, and maybe a Minister of Finance will, will because you were Minister of Finance before. There's something on the LRA called custom use of fees. How is it being used? Maybe Bama can explain that also. How is it being used by the LRA? Is it something that you put like that? What's the order? What's the order? The order is, What's the order? The order is that the nominees were addressed all properly, and we will address the nominees properly. Bama is not yet. We have the nominees. Order is sustained. Sorry, sir. Order was sent to the team to address the minister properly. Means that destiny. Mr. Destiny, maybe you can address that uh, because you were former minister before. Um, 
the LRA commission designate. This is a new fee for you, probably the minister can explain that because your minister of finance before. So I want to understand what is the purpose of the cost of use of, use of fee? Is it part of the national budget or is it something that costs of their control and use it anyway they want to use it? Anything that is being done in the context of revenue collected by LRA must be reflected as part of the envelope for the national budget. So I will respond in that manner. Okay, so it means that the national budget, the economic budget will, will see reflected, the economy will be reflected, right? Everything that borders on revenue collection will and must be captured in the national budget resource envelope. Okay, thank you. Okay. I, I will okay. Senator, are you okay with that? Because I mean, I won't bother you because you're dead boy. Okay. <laughs> Three more minutes. Three more minutes. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, but my fear, don't. I mean, you fear me. Sorry, sorry. 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 When you went, the reason why I asked whether you were the lead for the economic management team that collected the information, the reason why I asked you because you work at the bank, so you have both knowledge in fiscal and, and, and monetary management. I want to know, explain to us, what is the real story? It said that as of January 7, 17, it said that whatever on incumbent or incumbent, did you also meet a labyrinth that company at the bank? Order, order. Yeah. Let me ask this question. Yeah. What's the order? Yeah, yeah, what's the order? The order here is that the, the plenary Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Minister, you answer one more minute. I want to know the meeting. Thank you, Senator Maguire. So on this matter, you know we've been hearing several issues that have been discussed in the press. As we led the Economic and Financial Governance Cluster, Central Bank was one of those institutions we engaged. We had both on-site engagement and also receipt of documents, among which was report on the consolidated balance. What was reported on the 21st by the former President Weir in his address reflecting 220 million <coughs> and in the net international reserve and 40 million in the consolidated balance. When we heard that report, for the net international reserve, as report received, that's what we saw, 220.2 million, that's fine. For the 40 million, we went back to the CBA after that uh, announcement, and we asked the central bank, are you aware of the reporting of 40 million in the consolidated balance, as was reported by the former president, they indicated the governor in that meeting, DG for operation in that meeting, indicated they did not supply that information. So that was the first thing we took note of. Share with us what then is the information. They presented the submission. If you look at the submission, that 40 million violated the Public Financial Management Act, the restated Public Financial Management Act of 2009. They combined. There was a co-mingling of the fiscal year 2023 balances and fiscal year 2024. 
That means you, the Public Financial Management Act will, will have you and their section separate. So, and when you're reporting on revenue balances, say for 2023, it must reflect all collections of revenue for that period. So when you heard the president report on 20.5 of around 21 million, we had to say 2022 was the year in review that he was reporting on. 2023 is the year in review reporting on. So when you do that, Labyrinth mm -hmm. dollar balances, U.S. dollar mm -hmm. balances, you put them together, brings you to around the 20.5, 21 million, giving exchange rate mm -hmm. conversion. So what is important to let the public know, in December, the central bank indicated to us they were under pressure, and the Ministry of Finance, the government, drew down 80 million from the reserve to pay salaries for November and December. That's one. If you disaggregate this 21 million in our conversation with them, portion of the reserve room of around 80 million, 7.7 .7 million is on one of the lines called payroll. And we inquire, we want to pay for January. Why can we use it? The response was, this is part of the borrowing. So we hold it. So we hold it. And we say, when you do that, that means, in terms of actual revenue collection, you can be putting debt into the actual revenue basket for the period 2023. So if you take out even 7 million, it further reduces the actual balance. So on this matter, We'll be calling for an audit of that process just to make sure that the rest story is told because it is even in violation of Section 36 of the Public Financial Management Act that any new debt must have come to you first for your approbation, which was not done. And the second thing, it also violated that financing of budget deficit must have been included in the budget for fiscal year 2022, was that done? No one knows. And what was the basis to have gone to the central bank, especially on an IMF program that says there should be no monetary financing? And the central bank chose to take 80 million. So granted, if it's in 40 million, you give me 40 million, and you took away 80 million from me. That means you're already in the red. I'm making clarity so on this matter so that people can be clear. Oh, I'm saying, are you telling me? My question, what I want to know is this. 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 It means that there were two different figures. Fiscal year. And you can, and you, I, I don't want to know yeah. whether there were Liberian dollar component. Yes, that yes. The report they provided us has both Liberian dollar and, and U.S. dollar. That report, that both Liberian dollar and U.S. dollar, what did that, what did it come from to? That's what I want to know. Okay. So, for the record, GL balance report received the U.S. dollar is 15,967,236. 86 cents as reported to us. The Liberian other company is 1 billion, 55 million, 348,719. Converted, whichever rate we use, came to 5 million. And when you add those two, it's where. However, in this 50 million, we suspect, because from the response, that a payroll line item, 7.7 million. Do you support the free tuition program? As a librarian, wanting quality education for all, 
a free tuition policy is something that, yes, we will want to do. However, the question is, how free is free? Let there be some issues that should be put around in terms of ring fencing. Who qualifies for it? On what basis people call it? Oh, yeah, I'm, to I'm coming one minute asking a question. I am on time because you I want to answer to you all my time. Are you aware of Article 6 says how to provide math education to all the Yes, so it should be done in a structured way. It must come my to the budget. Is, what I to now, my question is, You've asked do me. you support the free educational program? Yes or no? I will support a free education that is done in a structured manner through the national budget, through Ministry of Education, in a way that benefits people who deserve it. Thank you very much. We'll take Senator Brown. Senator DeLong in that order. Senator Brown. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me join you quickly to congratulate the two nominees, uh, Honorable Kamara, Honorable Jala, and I'm proud to see that they, they have been accompanied here by their wives and children. You know, normally when we do confirmations here, we see people from some choir, they just come and go back. But having families, your families coming here for compliment, it, it, it tells us that we are together in this thing. So congratulations. The two of you uh, once served in government before you left, briefly, and now you're back. Whilst you were away, and I'm glad that Honorable Jala made mention of the Local Government Act, but in addition to that local government act, there were some other instruments that we, the, the government and the legislature, we the legislature, we felt that we needed to decentralize our fiscal policies and measures to increase revenue, especially to put money to finance local government in line with the local government act. But the challenge we have faced over the years since the approval of this act in 2018 is how do we implement this law or these laws? So I listened to Honorable Jala, but in concrete terms, Honorable Minister and Honorable Minister designate Honorable Jala, can you please tell us in concrete terms how do you intend to collaborate? so that um, we can operationalize the two laws within your respective mandates. That's the first question. How do you intend to operate, op op operationalize the two the, these, these instruments, the financial instruments that we pass, so that they can benefit our people as we envisage them in the arts? That's my first question to the two, two of you. Anybody can start at first. Thank you, Honorable Senator uh, Brown. I think on this, when we left up in 2018, the way that this process started, at least to give life to it and put more meaning, was through the county service center establishment across the counties. And that is, in my mind, I believe, if we just strengthen the county service center with the right support, uh, and then the incentive around which people can be assured that if they commit themselves in those county service centers around the country, that would be a way through the, the in which the revenue sharing scheme. Sir, uh, sir, let me be very specific. Uh, if you read the local government act, uh, chapter four, talks about financing local government, and we list a number of taxes. All right that should be collected at the local level, Sorry. at the level of the county, at the level of the cities, Sorry. and a portion of that should be left there. My question is, how do you intend, how will you 
operationalize this measures. So, and that's what I'm saying. So the administrative structure around that, mm -hmm. as long as you, those services for birth certificate and what have you, as long as they are related to revenue generation there, in terms of what they do, it is where then it has to be mapped up clearly. When you collect it, just as we do for LRA, this portion comes to you. And we think we should just strengthen that institutional structure and start from there. Right. So let me hear from LRA because everything is still coming to the consolidated account. Yeah. So, so Senator, uh, thank you. This is a very good question. You know, uh, Imam, uh, brief consultations with the technicians and, and uh, senior management of LRA these past couple of days. I have been informed that LRA is act has actually embarked on a pilot, you know, for domestic revenue mobilization in Grand Bassa County. So we are in one of the districts where we are piloting the collection of uh, domestic taxes. So our hope is to be able to expand that. And some of the things we intend to do is to deploy technology, which will then help to increase our efficiency. So now that the, the budget has gone back to the executive, if confirmed, I'm going to work as seriously with the team at LRA so that we can be able to you know, direct you know, some financing into that area so that based on the outcomes that we'll get from this pilot in Grand Basel, we can expand from one district to other district as well as expand in other counties. So we already have you know, uh, this pilot framework going and we intend to build on that, the learning experiences we'll get and will continue. Of course, the service centers, you know, has been one of the key achievements I think that we made as a people, and it will be good for us to continue that. Unfortunately, we apparently didn't work out the financing mechanism properly for these service centers. So what was happening is that the resources, because our resources essentially are still local, I mean centralized in Monrovia. So, so this, this new regime, what it's going to do is that it's going to give us the wherewithal to be able to you know, work with the municipalities and local government in collecting taxes and fees, and then it will all go in a, in a consolidated account. But in the proportion that the legislature will agree will be automatically transferred to the effective local government account so that there can be transparency and accountability in the process. Thank you, sir. I had a question that uh, Senator uh, Chair, former pro tem, asked briefly. It has to do with the the reform measures in post conflict Liberia, where we merge the Ministry of Finance with the Ministry of Economic uh, Economic Affairs. Uh, and as he rightfully said, and as you acknowledge, the the, the, the play and development department is, 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 has been wanting over the years. So you are taking over, Honorable Minister. Uh, my question is, how do you intend to make the planning and development department functional? I was envisaged in the measure. What planning methodology are you going to adapt so that the figures you bring before us as a budget will reflect the developmental needs of our people. Thank you, Senator Brown. So on this, uh, as we've been doing some review across uh, the department, before we can achieve the process of request for separation, mm -hmm. internally, the first thing is that people must be given the independence to function. And that's, that's something we, we found that was lost. Uh, you still have technicians within the Ministry of Finance who have the experience. And we believe we must work with them. In addition, with support from our international partner to strengthen the development plan and peace of the ministry. So in the interim, as interim measure, once confirmed, we believe that's how we want to go in, identify the talents, identify the gaps, and then make sure where need be for assistance. We work with our international partner who have expressed 
their willingness to even to support us and move the development plan piece to a new level. Senator, may I? Yeah. Yes. Uh, having served before as the Deputy Minister of Planning for Regional and Sectoral Planning, uh, one of the things I would like to suggest to this August body in this <clears throat> discussion is for us to consider, like the minister said, elevating that function, maybe set up a planning commission. Because by merging it with the economic piece, like the two of you have indicated, you know, economic uh, policy and planning will continue to be highlighted because that's the mainstay of the Ministry of Finance. But then spatial planning and other kinds of planning, you know, will be subjugated, and that's what we've seen. So to me, it will be good to have, you know, its own, you know, a standalone fu functionality of government that is responsible for those aspects of planning, which is really very, very important. If you take zoning, for instance, is one big problem that we have currently. You know, we have zoning. You know, there's a small uh, a unit in Ministry of Public Works, but that's not sufficient. See how Monrovia is expanding on all fronts towards the RIA and everywhere. There's absolutely no zoning. There's absolutely no city planning. So we do need a planning functionary of government. They know that you know can be robustly equipped to be able to address these developmental concerns. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have two more questions, and if, if possible, if possible, if possible, let me let me ask them the, the, the two of them at the same time, and then you can. One has to do with Nokar, uh, the National Oil Corporation, Company of Liberia, Honorable Minister. You once served as, uh, I believe, uh, I mean, you were the finance minister, and by by the act, you are a statutory member of the board, I believe. Uh, the reason why I'm asking you is, during your administration, we saw the collapse of, of Nuka. Um, I remember when we were doing the budgeting here, Nuka could not even afford to pay the final salaries and severance benefits of its employees. You had to make a presentation and we had to swallow a better pain to place those into the national budget. Now we heard recently that President Walker has, um, has named an interim head of local. Honorable Minister, can you briefly comment on what circumstances led to the collapse of local? And two, what has informed the President's decision? What is the financial vibrancy of Nokao now for which the president wants to name people there? How is Nuf what's the sovereignty of Nokao now? What are or what will be the sources of its funding? The last question. Up to the 2023 elections, Liberia was enrolled into the IMF program. Honorable Minister, I would like to know from you, uh, this new government. What is your position? What will be the position of the President Boca's administration as regards the IMF program? Are we, are we going to continue to enroll or are you going to discontinue? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Yeah, that's, that's the final question. So please be brief in your answers. And then we'll take Senator DeLong, Senator Nufwey and Senator Taylor and Chi in our Mr. Chair, Co-Chair, uh, Honorable Senators, questions around why Nuka failed, what uh, the circumstances around which uh, brought it to that stage. We all know in the context of uh, anything in the context of a resource, I mean a revenue generating entity. I for one, we believe almost all SOEs going far, lessons of the past. Why it failed, we can go back to searching why it failed, and if need be, proceed with audit, and to make sure that issues that went wrong are identified, we learn the lessons. But in this current context as we speak, NOCAL is a vibrant institution associated with oil well. 
And obviously, it must be an entity of focus to making sure uh, the appropriate uh, qualify, the appropriate structure, functions defined, and make it to be that entity that can be held liable in the future. And so I would say for NUCA and its operation, the decision by the president to appoint an officer in charge, that means an officer in charge until the appropriate uh, nomination is done to fill those vacancies. And it does not only apply to NUCA, so there are other <coughs> institutions where there will be officer in charge until full nomination is done. But on the question for the IMF program, obviously an IMF program with this country is needed. As I indicated in my uh, 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 remarks, an IMF program should be complemented in terms of marking up where we want resources to be spent. The IMF plays a catalytic role. What that means, a program with the IMF will be conditioned presidents for World Bank support, European Union support to our country. So certainly, we have been in some prior engagement just to make sure that we align, and there's going to be a mission, um, hopefully soon, and that mission will lay the groundwork for the new ECF program with the country, as we speak. And that would be some of the reasons why our development partners will further engage us, and in the context, we're looking for for greater, greater, greater collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister. That's it. We said at the beginning of this uh, hearing that the public will have the opportunity to channel uh, in a question of constraint. So I would like to ask Senator uh, Dumbo, who is in charge of that, to let us know whether there is anything coming out of the public. Uh, Honorable Chair, Distinguished Senator, uh, we informed the Secretary of Arts to collect information from the public back here, but we see no concern of the public. Thank you very much. We'll not take Senator Delong. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Dominis. Thank you. I have a refrain that I normally repeat at this year. Confirmation hearing is job interview. Confirmation hearing is serious. And that is why the framework of the Constitution made for Constitution. It should not just be the mere formality. I want you to remind yourselves that you are on board. The President of Liberia delivered his honor message, and he said the economy, the state of the economy of our country, is in distress. But the hope of our people should be kept alive. In order to keep our people hope alive, the President has reposed confidence in the two of you, the two nominees, to help revitalize this economy and turn it around. And so, our role here is to aid that. Now to my questions. One, the President in his other message said that he would do drug tests because Fighting drug is a key uh, priority of this administration. Will you do drug tests? Question of two of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. I will do drug tests. Most certainly. Who said no? Who said no? What will you do now? Why will you do that? And so that uh, it can inform our vote. There's this commission. Both of you, when? 
in my case, I could do that as quickly as possible. Can you vote? Can leave from here? Can you vote? Yeah, yes. I could do that as quickly as possible as I leave from here. So for drug test for me, maybe we'll even call the doctor. I'll do that. Yeah. We will make arrangements to do the drug test next week. Thank you. The are all of us. I want you to remember this answer. Yes. Thank you. And can supply you the results if you want them. Please do. Okay. Uh, Mr. L. Nomini. Yes, Our current envelope sells around 600 million. Do you think, have you done an assessment of the revenue uh, areas of our country? And do you think that is realistic, understated, or we can grow our budget, our revenue, by sourcing places where revenue should be collected from, but we're, out, we're not putting our hands there for all the other reasons. Question. Well, Senator, thank you. Um, I pretty believe that we can generate a lot more then was projected in the draft budget that was submitted, I think which was around 625 million. Right. I think we can do more than that. You know, there are places within our revenue generation system that I said we were hoping to uh, that we can all work on. You know, closing. There are some places that are waste. There are some abuse in the system. You know, there are revenue leakages. So the company said, I have limited time. Within 10 minutes, uh, I, don't want, I don't want you to leave it very brief when you respond. Okay. Our current envelope of about 600 million, is it realistic? Is it our state? Can we grow our support? I think it's just about 625 million from what I saw. Yeah, I think that is realistic. And then when we get in, we will work assiduously to see whether we can grow that. Did you do with analysis or assessment to know what do you think is realistic or there are other places people call or hoping to grow in revenue? Yes, I think that, you know, I spoke to the RICS folks at LRA. Okay. And, but we need some investments because there's some constraints that they have. You know, so if we can invest in ensuring that we mitigate the risks that they have identified, you know. Let, then, uh, okay, an example is that some of our collection points are manually operated. Okay, because they are manual systems, it means the country relies on the individual discretion of that person who is recording the tallies and all of that. If we deploy technology there, that can remove the individual discretion and then that hopefully will carry things up. Also, the LRA piloted the deployment of fiscal devices. And I understand that, you know, a business, the business where it was targeted, I mean, that where it was piloted is a small librarian business. And the, the uh, 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 user taxes that were generated previously so what was a number of hundreds of dollars. Oh, thank you. I don't know if you may call that. So okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, do you know about or have you heard about the company in at the Freeport? The what? About the company at Freeport called CTN. Or have you done an assessment of what's happening at the port when it comes to doing cases at the port? All the bureaucracies and bottlenecks and all of these things. Have you done any analysis of that to know uh, to, to, to tell me what you intend to do? Well, CTN, some of yeah, CTN. And uh, if you know about CTN, the CTN revenue went into the Ministry of Consumer Development. Uh, Minister, I mean, sorry, Senator, I would like to ask your indulgence so that I will have to consult with you know, my technicians and then I can get back to you. Uh, but let me assure you that under my leadership, you know, those are some of the things, if, if we identify such things as an inefficiency, then we'll, we'll be able to take the appropriate action. One of the things LRA has been proffering all along from what I hear is a single window to make it easier 
for businesses to be able to pay their taxes as well as you know clear their cargo and all of that. So so these are some of the places we'll be looking at. And if it is inefficient and not doing what it's supposed to do to give our people the kind of relief that we need, we'll come back to you with recommendations for mitigation. Thank you. Uh, I will work. We will work with you. Okay. So we do the task force. Thank you. Uh, you were Minister of Finance before, and you operated a budget program like this, correct? Do you believe in Atom Mass program based budgeting? Question. I believe in program-based budgeting and not itemized budgeting. Okay. Program-based budgeting must be informed by performance as associated with projects. For example, part of what we are thinking in terms of just bringing meat to the national budget is to begin the process of earmarking, say Kush as an example. Can we earmark in the national budget now to make sure that we get full traction to the recognition that Kush is an, is an issue impacting on our people? So in the budget, include for a line item sale for mental health. And when we do for mental health, it lays a basis that clearly says government is interested in the people and addressing that matter for which it is not being earmarked. Also earmark, for example, say public health. So in those ways, they are addressing, in a direct way, program-related uh, performance that you'll be holding people to account. Thank you. Sometimes when we ask questions, it sounds a little naive. Or sometimes we're going to test that anything. Yeah. Okay. One minute. I'm checking the time. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got an official time. Oh, we got an official time. I think I'm checking the time. I knew you were going to jump quick. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Mr. Minister. Definitely. I have the two, 2023 fiscal budget here. The Ministry of Finance budget for 2023 is 129 million. 129 million. Part of the 129 million the Ministry of Finance get grant, payment for grant, or grant, foreign liability for instance, 12 million. Domestic debt, 74 million. Fiscal auto sales, 74 million. If you put previous years back, it's almost half a billion that we've paid in domestic debt. How are you going to treat domestic debt payment and the transparency with which we treat it? Do you want to commit to ensure that if you project in $10 for domestic debt, that $10 must have been informed by a list? Do you commit on a court that there will be transparency for us to see that list? Question. Mr. Dillon, we do commit. And the first thing, Around that, when confirmed? Yes. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> we'll begin the process first of doing the audit to know exactly to whom payment was made in line with the budget for those previous years. That's the first thing. And enhanced, if in the context of enhancing transparency, we'll reintroduce the debt management committee in its full function. And the other layer that follow the debt management committee operation will be to reintroduce the economic management team. Parliament, what's your performance report? Your comment? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we fully commit to budget, budget performance report as we did 
in 18 months, we sat at the Ministry of Finance from 2016 May to end December 2017. We are on record of making sure that those fiscal outings were done in time, and we'll commit ourselves to honor that. That's the possibility of increasing civil service out of the possibility. Now, no politics. At this point in time, to increase salary is something we cannot propose because the current wage bill of over 300 million, something that rings bell for all of us, is the public sector the right place for that because it takes away almost 50%. So the first thing, there is an audit that has been done of the personnel and payroll for 2018 to 2021 December that we have been informed of, and there are issues there. What's your view of public official at our government doing a austerity measure to cut down our money, including yours if we are performed? I fully, I fully agree, and that's why from the view of the executive, we have already advised the president that the fiscal rule must be reintroduced. And the fiscal rule, as an example, that says if I'm traveling as minister, we travel economy. The fiscal rule says for now put freeze on new hiring until you do proper audit of the entire uh, civil service the in the way. Rule says you should reduce the salary or the Fiscal rule does not call for salary reduction because we have to operate within the confines of the law. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you, Senator. The law will now take Senator Nukwe, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Honorable Minister.